I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl. I appreciate you uh, spending some time with us. We are still in Boise and very happy to introduce today Terrence Paternoster. Paternoster. Did I get that right? Yes. Hey, nice to have you here. and sharing your story. Fascinating story, and so let's get right to it. You're, uh, were you born in this area? I was born in Boise. Were you? I lived in Boise my whole life. Wow. Never been gone longer than 10 days. Really? On vacation or something? Yes, huh? <laughs> yes. It's a beautiful area up here. Uh, got lush farmland, I guess, and, and lots of water coming through, and hopefully no, Four flooding. Seasons. no flooding this year. Four seasons. And you yeah. get much snow? Uh, a little bit in the valley this year, we got quite a bit yeah. um, compared to previous yeah, years. Yeah, I think we had a, 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 out of Utah, got our best Bumper snow crop. for a long time. So, Were you born in the church? I was born in the church. Yeah, and uh, mom and dad active and everything? Mom and dad active. Now, you're the oldest, you, you were telling me. I have me. an older sister, so I come from a family of seven kids. Oh, and you're the second. And so <laughs> I'm the oldest male in the family. Okay. Uh, named after my father. Oh, were you? Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I have three brothers and three sisters. Okay. And again, just normal Mormon life? I mean, you went to primary? And went to primary. Yeah. Baptized at age baptized eight? Baptized at eight. Yeah. Priested at 12. What do you think of that being baptized at eight thing? Is that? That's a good question. Baptized. What are you being baptized into at that point? Uh, accountability. Yeah. I mean, you're, you being, get it? you're being baptized into being accountable to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Yeah. Did you sense that you were, I mean, now I look back on it as an adult, I just figure, well, we're being baptized into the church, make sure we're on the church records. And I mean, you're not being baptized to Jesus, are you? Did you sense that at all? I've, uh, it was the first time that I really remember being interviewed. Yeah. Uh, you know, because they go through that little quick interview, yeah. you know, that an eight-year-old. An eight-year-old, are you worthy? <laughs> are, yeah. And you just go, I don't even know what these people are asking me, you know. <laughs> yes, I want to get baptized. Yeah. And, well, you've been pushed ever since you were six or seven. Are you going to get baptized? When do you get baptized? And, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Anyway, so primary, and then you go into young men's, and yes. are you active with that? And all, yeah. All that yeah. jazz. And, Deacon, teacher, priest, yeah. active. In fact, you were president or something, weren't you, of the oh. quorum? Oh, I was not president of the quorum. Weren't you? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. Okay. Active in scouts, though, I guess. Active in scouts, got my Eagle Scout. Oh, good for you. Yeah. Did, did all of those? I couldn't swim, so I never got my Eagle. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> did, did all of those things. Fortunately, I had a very nice uh, lady that was in our ward who helped me get my Eagle project written up and turned mm -hmm. in, you know, a couple you months before I turned 18. And oh, is that what? You, oh. Scram, cram smart, it smart thinking. So, uh, seminary? Seminary, all four years. Yeah, seminary graduate. Did you feel like you had a testimony of the church? I felt like the church was true. Yeah. I felt like... Had you read the Book of Mormon at all? Uh, pieces, yeah. parts. Yeah, from seminary and stuff, yeah. assignments. And about, about the equivalent that I would have said I would have read the Bible or... <laughs> um, you know, the Book of Mormon or the so Pearl of Great Price or anything <laughs> else. The pieces I needed to read. I was not yeah. a great academic uh, individual oh, no. in those ages. On the and, spiritual side of things. Huh? Oh, not in school either. Oh. Just did not have a lot of desire to uh, study. Yeah. 
So did uh, any questions ever come up or during this time of your life? Um, ab about the church? Yeah, yeah. Doctrine or nothing I, you had I to... Did, I did not on. have any red flags about the doctrine. No, okay. I, I thought that it was true. My, okay. my biggest red flags were about my own ability hmm. to maintain worthiness. Oh, okay. So did you uh, end up going on a mission? No. I did, I did not you go did on a not. mission. And it's, it's kind of an interesting story, but go ahead and share that. <laughs> yeah, well, let, let, me, let me back up a little okay. bit because, you know, you, t you talked about baptism yeah. and just that point in life. And for me, there's, there's, I look at some very milestone things that happened in my uh, development. Yeah. Uh, and one of them was that um, about the time I was seven or eight, my parents, there's a, up above Boise, there's a city that's called Idaho City, and there was a church camp up there that, that's still owned by the church that's called Pine Top. Okay. And my parents would occasionally go up there and we would go up and camp. So the Cub Scouts would go uh, and the scouts? Sometimes, the scouts would sometimes go, yeah. but it was really a church camp and there was a pool and it was probably some wow. donated property and my yeah. parents would frequently go up there because we happened to be in the stake that had, the, that, had, had that, that facility, property, yeah. right? And so we would frequently go up there with uh, friends in our ward. And one of the times that we went up there, we would go on these hikes and there was a tree that we'd go hike to and then there's kind of a mountain range that, you know, not really mountain, but more of a canyon that has a pillar on the top and kind of a little altar that somebody had built on the top. And so we'd go through this hike. And during that time, I, I always like to be first. You know, in my life, I've always liked to just, you know, be the first one out, go run, right. let's go, you know, get there faster than everybody right. else. And during this process, I got lost. You know, on one of these hikes, I got lost. Oh, Nobody knew I was lost. But I had... You did. <laughs> yeah. I, I, oh, I did. I yeah. did. I knew I was lost. Yeah. And I remember just thinking, is somebody coming? Because I got so far ahead that I looked behind, nobody came. Nobody was there. And there was this interesting moment in time that I'd already developed a knowledge, a great awareness of sin in my life. Hmm. Um, at a very early age. Yeah. Can, I, I think compared to a lot of people. And, you know... The interesting thing was is that I would come home from school, I'd walk to school, and I'd come home from school, and I had this little rhyme that I would sing to myself, and it was nothing but swear words, right? Oh, dear. <laughs> Not, nothing but swear words. And you practiced words. that regularly. And I would rhyme it all the way home, and I would say it, and it was just, I, I wouldn't even repeat it. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's they, were just bad. <laughs> they were just awful swear words. And so I got in this negotiation with God when I got lost. And I said, God, if you get me back, I will never, never do this again. Just get me back, yeah. you know? And I finally found like this pipe and kind of followed it back and ended up getting, coming back. Fine. Everybody was there my family. I come from a big family. Yeah. And I realized nobody knew I was God, but I now had this in debt to God. <laughs> and I quickly realized that I didn't keep it. And so at a oh. very early age, after being baptized, I'm realizing I have sin issues. And so throughout my... Isn't that interesting? Um, I, I think it is interesting. Yeah. Because I, I felt like my struggles, you know, largely with Mormonism wasn't about LDS doctrine as much as it was me. I couldn't keep the law. And the older I got... And you realized that was a conflict that you couldn't resolve. I didn't know why I couldn't resolve it. Right. Yeah, that you, you kept falling, yeah, falling short, as we say. Interesting. Yes, yes. And that, and that perplexed me throughout my adolescence, yeah. you know, into, you know, once you start those bishops' interviews and they start yeah. asking those questions, I'd meet with the bishop at 12, <laughs> and they'd ask you the questions, and at first I'm just going, I better just lie. I think I'm going to get in trouble if my parents find out that I didn't get to the, go to the temple or something and start asking me questions. I eventually got to a point that I just said, I'm done lying. I'm just going to tell him what it is and live with the consequences. And you did that. And I did that. Yeah, you told the bishop and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some some of my struggles, and I I would say that uh, <laughs> I enjoyed sin quite a bit, and uh, ended up on church probation at one point. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> which which was awkward. Yeah. Because I I came where my parents live is really close to the Boise State campus, and so there wasn't a lot of kids my age in my ward, and so if I wasn't up blessing the sacrament or doing my role. 
it was kind of obvious and so I, I really felt kind of outcast to a yeah. certain extent because here I am not being able to take the sacrament and well, don't you think a lot of people actually feel that internally? They may not express it like you eventually did, but I mean, that's just built into the system, don't you? Isn't that what you're, that's where the hypocrisy and everything comes in, right? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. But I mean, Mormons have to, you can't go through a temple recommend question or the interview with the bishop without burying something and hoping he doesn't get the inspiration to ask you a specific question. <laughs> yeah, it probably didn't matter which question he answered. I, I probably didn't come to. I'm guilty. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. And so, and so going back, you know, I mean, I tried a lot of things to try to make myself righteous. Like I, I would selectively date like a stake president's daughter or a bishop's daughter or keep... people who I thought would um, improve my character and maybe help keep me more um, morally straight. But in the end, I think that my, their morality was no better than mine. Well, it's so interesting you say that. And that's such a, a perception to pick up on as a, as a young man because I felt those things, but I didn't, I wouldn't inter I would never say them anywhere or even maybe internally think that because I was, I knew I was going to disappoint God and my family. And so you're just hypocritical. Yes. At some point, I think you get to the point that you feel like, God, I don't know if I can disappoint you any further. I already feel like that, you know, I'm headed to the lower kingdoms. <laughs> this is where my life is going, you know, and possibly, you know, going yeah. on a mission might have resolved that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I get up to that point. So of, you get to that point and get, get to the point of um, deciding to go, and... deciding to go, went and had the physical, um, started filling out the paperwork, went and met with the bishop. And then started hitting the word of wisdom questions, and he realized how short I came. <laughs> that uh, I'd done some things the night before that really weren't in alignment with the word of wisdom. And he says, "You know, this really isn't quite um, you're not worthy up to standard. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you try to stop that and come back in six weeks, and we'll see where you're at then, and let's you know yeah. move forward from that Interesting. point." Interesting. So, did you end up going on, on a mission? mission? Yeah, I I, I didn't. Um, Okay. And, and, you know, there was, there was a few reasons, and I think that it goes a lot to a guilt and shame. Is sure. I was raised with the belief that I was responsible to pay for my own mission. I mean, as young children, we were oh, admonished yeah. to save your money and put it away. And, and you I, didn't have a savings to do that? <laughs> well, I made money. My yeah. mom was very uh, good at getting me jobs, <laughs> and I worked a lot of jobs, but I didn't seem to save the money. Yeah. I seemed to spend it. Yeah. And so when I went to the bishop, he says, go ask your family. And I'm thinking, there is no way I'm going to ask my family to pay for my, my, mission. my mission. My parents were not wealthy, no. um, very meager means, which means I'd have to go ask my grandparents and the aunts and uncles. And I'm just going, I don't know about this. But I started to experience a different problem at that point in my life. And it was that, you know, up until 19, because now I'd turn 19, yeah. that... You know, I had lots of girlfriends. I love the dances. I love the social aspects, you know. Yeah. I loved women, girls, probably <laughs> girls in hindsight at that age. And, but they were all starting to push me and saying, you really need to be going on your mission. You know, those things that, you know, we were doing a year ago. I'm not up to that now. You need to go on a mission. Yeah. Well, so I, I resolved that problem by <laughs> dating somebody who was an LDS. Oh, that's how you... And so I was working with somebody at one of my jobs. I worked at McDonald's when I was uh, 18, 19. Yeah. And I met somebody who wasn't LDS, and was she didn't care if I went on a mission. Was she Christian in the sense of active? I, oh, you know, from a Mormon perspective, I would consider her to be what I'd always viewed a lot of Christians, which they have a said faith, but they didn't attend church regularly. Mm. They, you know, claimed a belief, but nothing active. And her best friend, so she had another male friend who wasn't um, a boyfriend or anything who was in her life. And he and I tried to push her to take the missionary lessons. Oh, try to convert her to become yeah. LDS. Oh right? yeah, I, I, we both believed it's, it was true. And so <laughs> yeah. we're trying to convert her. And so we got her to take the missionary lessons. So and you were on a mission. <laughs> I, I was on a mission. I was on a mission to convert my wife. Yeah. Uh, not, or soon to be wife. Yeah. Um, so I end up 
Oops. So, so this is kind of where the story goes. So I had really three problems that I was trying to solve at this particular moment in my life. Yeah. And the problems, the problems were that I was, I'd moved out right after high school with my older sister and was living and realized that it was expensive to live out on your own. And so I had to move back home. Okay. My parents had me under a curfew despite being like 19 and yeah. I was paying rent. <laughs> My parents were putting pressure on me to go on a mission, sure. and I had a particular sin issue that uh, I liked uh, women, and <laughs> I needed to resolve, and so I came up with a plan, and my plan was that if I was to get married, this solves everything. You don't have to go on a mission. I, I don't have to go on a mission. It gets me out of my parents' house. Yeah. Uh, it solves my morality issues, because I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm now married. Yeah. yeah. And my understanding is once I was married, even if I got divorced, I wouldn't be eligible to go on a mission because yeah. typically they don't send right. people who have been married. And so I thought, there's my plan. With a backup plan that, you know, I think my wife was going to become Mormon, yeah. firmly believing the church to be true. We didn't talk about it a lot dating. And, and, and basically decided that uh, if she didn't become Mormon, yeah. my, my plan was... 19 year old logic. Uh, I'll just divorce her in a couple of years. I'll be accepted back into the fold. Everything will be good and yeah. I'll resolve this. So you end up marrying her and you know, she, she stays Christian, of course. And what happens? Yeah, I? yeah, I marry her. And then for the first time, she decides to go back to church. Um, and she takes you with, him, no, with her? No, oh, no, no. I did not go to her church. Oh, no, at I, first. Uh, <laughs> not for quite some time. Oh, okay. Instead, some, she brought. I don't know if she brought her so much. Some people who knew her from her church decided to come over to our apartment and come knock on the door and want to talk to me. Yeah. And I told her pretty sternly, don't do that. I'm not interested. Uh, the only so even though you couldn't live the commandments of the church, you still felt the church was true and, and this was eventually the way we needed to go. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. I, I, absolutely. I, I didn't know what it would take to get me to, to the point of righteousness. Yeah. You know, which is the word that I would mm -hmm. use is that I wanted to feel righteous. I wanted to be accepted by God. Yeah. But growing up, I realized that I had a huge <laughs> weight on my back of sin because yeah. I understood pretty well the doctrine and covenants and pieces that, you know, true forgiveness and right. repentance involves what the process took. of not repeating yeah, sin. Repenting, yeah. So what eventually happens to? Well, um, so, so we, my wife kind of backs off. She pressuring you, know, you to go to yeah, church. Yeah, she didn't pressure me to go to church. She just wanted me to talk to some people. Oh, okay. It wasn't even a pressure. She really kind of backed off. We had discussions here and there about occasional things and I would go, I don't know, you know, I'm sure if I went to my Bible and I looked it up, I would come up with some answer. There's some answer for this. And I felt pretty satisfied yeah. with that, but I wasn't actively attending church. Occasionally I would go to a homecoming from one of my you know, yeah. friends that went on a mission or something. Right. And then I would come back feeling really guilty about my own life and my own position. But God started to put a pressure on my life of making me feel like I was a hypocrite. Oh. And how he did that was because I used the theory with my wife as I said, the only reason that you believe what you believe is that is how your parents raised you. Right. You grew up in this Christian, pseudo-Christian household. They told you these things. You went this way. That's what you believed. You don't have the fullness of the gospel. You don't have the priesthood. You don't have prophets. You don't have all of these other things. I understand that, but, but it's not quite good enough. Yeah, you don't have it all. You do not have you know. it all. So, how did you resolve that, or what happened in your oh. life? what happened in your life? To well, God put pressure on me, and I mean, He started to bring people into my lives, my life, where I would had a particular job that allowed for quite a bit of dialogue. I was working at a manufacturing plant and with, with, with Christians, with Christians, and I was debating the Mormon side. And I would give, you know, a, oh, a Bible, a Bible. You know, I have a Bible. I need nothing else for I have a Bible. And, yeah. you know, I would try to refute their claims. And hey, you actually started reading the Bible. Is that right? Uh, not initially. It took about oh. a year. Yeah. And I got to the point that, that God really convicted me and said, 
how are you any different than what you're really claiming your life is? You know, you grew up in a church that you thought was true. Your parents took you to it. You attended that your whole life. Right. You've ne never really went off and tested it. And so I came up with this logic that said, okay, the Bible came before the Book of Mormon. Um, although the Eighth Article of Faith kind of limits, you know, how good the Bible, good really, the Bible is. really is, yeah. um, I'm going to start reading the Bible. And I've read the Old Testament, and it is boring. <laughs> so at 19, I said, I better start with the New Testament. It's much shorter. Let's just go read the, those sections, yeah. and let's just go see where this leads. And I basically said to God, you know, God, I am going to pray to you every day. I'm going to ask that you give me eyes to see, you give me an open heart, oh. whatever may come, may come. Good for you. But, but fully believing that this would lead me back. Back to the church. To, to the church. To Mormonism, yeah. It would support Mormonism. Sure, but it didn't. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians. Galatians. Did and, that get you? And, and Galatians got me. And I got to Galatians chapter 1. And, I mean, anybody who reads Galatians, uh, I mean, if you read Galatians and you look at that, that is a book that is designed about false gospels. Yeah. Right? If even an angel comes and, and preaches another gospel. Yeah, and, and you know, I was reading. And you're right, that. the Bible was here first. It was here first. I didn't ever think of that either. In Mormonism, we kind of think of all four scriptures as they stand alone in their own way, but when we refer to the scriptures, it's all of them. So we just figure the Mormon gospel is in, in all of them. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's so true. So then when you look at the Bible by itself and read Galatians, then you realize, hmm, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, and, and what's, what's fascinating is because sometimes I think, how did I, you know, I, I believe God truly had a, a calling on my life. I had a deep desire in my life to be accepted by God, to want to be righteous before God. Mm -hmm. And I really lived like with such shame that yeah. I didn't know how. But when I got to Galatians 1, and it's, it's interesting, I was reviewing it again last night, that, that Paul repeats his warning twice. It's right. not even that he says it once, he says yeah. it the second time. I want to like, emphasize he, this. <laughs> yes, get it. If even I or an angel of light comes and yeah. preaches another gospel, right. let him be accursed. Right. Let me say it again, just in case you missed it the first time, people. Yeah. If, if an, you know, if yeah. someone's preaching a different gospel, which then starts to lead the question, what is the gospel? Yeah. Right. Now, I know I'm kind of pushing, believe it or not, our time is just zooming by, but uh, did you have a, a moment then that you finally, because you put this trust in, oh, yeah. in Jesus and that kind of stuff, we oh, probably oh, ought to get to that. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm close. Yeah. Yeah, so you, I, hit, I hit Galatians. Yeah. I'm in chapter one, and I read that, and it just starts fireworks going off in my head saying, Whoa, an angel of light. This so much reminds me of the stories that I had been taught in Mormonism. <laughs> angel Moroni. Yeah. Right, angel Moroni. But I didn't have a reconciling, how to reconcile that back to all of the other things, the priesthood, the prophets, and everything else. But what I did was, and what I love so much about Galatians is they don't make you wait. Paul didn't make you wait very long. No. Quickly in chapter 2. The point is, is that if the works of the law were sufficient to produce righteousness, then Christ died in vain. And we didn't need him. We didn't need him. Yeah. We didn't need him. But then I'm going, well, then what was the purpose of the law? Then why did you go give the law? And fortunately, in chapter 3, and these aren't long chapters. I mean, no. there are a few verses, right? Yeah. It's, it's, the law was our schoolmaster to lead us to faith in Christ. Yeah. It, it's, its whole purpose was to show us our unrighteousness, to show us we're not worthy, so that we had a new covenant, a different covenant that yeah. God had made with Abraham, yeah. and that we could be part of that seed. Yeah. And, and really kind of the ceiling portion for me is, you know, because when I read it in chapter 3 and I'm thinking about this, I just said, God, I don't know. You know, I don't claim to be the smartest person in the world, but I so much, if this is true, I accept I accept. I give up. I have tried my life to be righteous before you, and I failed. I fell. I always will. <laughs> I always will. I give up. And did you begin to understand what Jesus had done for us at that point on it, the cross? It was instantaneous that really? there was this flash that it no longer mattered about a pre-existence, the prophets, 
the Joseph Smith story, it only became about Jesus. It became about me and my position before God that God had imputed righteousness to me. And for anybody who doubts that... Isn't that amazing? Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's unbelievable, but it is so simple because, because that's the thing that Mormonism pushes, right? Yeah. Is, that, is that you need these extra things... But that it, you have to earn and do, not what Jesus did. Yeah, the third article of faith is prime, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, we believe that all mankind may be saved by obedience, obedience to, to the, the laws Lord. and ordinances of the gospel, yeah. right? But you hit Galatians 5, verses 1 through 4, and Paul says, no, guys, look, it's, it's you or, or Jesus. If you want it to be you, that's fine. You take it, but you own the whole law. You're judged by the law. Yeah, you have to do all of it. You're judged by the law. Yeah. But it's Jesus, and so there's not my addition to it. And so at that point, good for you. it was gone, and then it became deep research and study into and now you know more about mormonism than probably most mormons do is that right <laughs> uh, i would say that's probably true yeah i mean yes. we learn we start we have our eyes open and we start understanding what the temple's all about and masonry and and all the what book of mormon problems there are and yeah yes it well, I'm proud of you. It's just so, uh, and, you, and that moment you just be, were able to trust Jesus, he became something a little different then than your older brother and the guy, the, the guy that picks it up at the end. Yeah, f f fills in the gap at the end. Yeah. yeah. My Lord, my Savior. Yeah, my King. And, yeah. My, my Master, yeah. right? He owns my life. And he's the one that's righteous. Yes. And we get, like you said, imputed with his righteousness. Yes. That makes us able to stand clean. Yes. Isn't that a, and it's so godlike. It's so simple. Yes. And yet Mormons misunderstand that, don't they? Unfortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. What do you think they most misunderstand? Grace is one for sure. And who Jesus is. I think that that there's a natural desire to want to believe that somehow we have an importance that we can contribute and do good works. And that somehow it feeds our own pride. I mean, if one thing I can look back is I had a lot of pride as a Mormon. Even me not even keeping the, it. Even with the guilt and the shame, the shame and all that. I, yeah. I had pride. Yeah. I guess your wife was thrilled. and uh, She didn't know about my backup plan until after that point. <laughs> and, and, then your, uh, and then your family, I guess. We're, we're actually out of time, Terrence, but... And what a wonderful story you've shared. But I know it's tough, though, isn't it? Family can, can shun and, and not be uh, supportive and a challenge. So anyway, thanks so much, and we'll see you again next time. Great. Thank you.